So we're going to get started here. Uh, welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied fields related to the built environment. And today we have Guerrilla Urbanism with Jason Hyman, Margaret Brown, and Fernando Pages Ruiz. So join us for upcoming webinars. We have an author's forum coming up next week on the book, The Equity Planner, March 19th, again from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern time. And on April 2nd, we have another author's forum on the book, City Limits. Go to cnu.org slash resources slash on the park bench for more information and to register and registered for CNU 32. And CNU 32 is gonna be in Cincinnati, Ohio on May 15th or 18th. And this historic river city has rebuilt its urban core, harnessing its own diversity to overcome adversity. Learn more and register at cnu.org slash CNU 32. And today we have a panel all from Texas that's going to be talking about guerrilla urbanism. It's a grassroots activist creative approach to city building that lends, that tends to ask forgiveness rather than permission. And first there's going to be a presentation followed by a brief discussion among the panelists and then Q&A from the audience. Please use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask your questions as they occur to you. And first up is going to be Fernando Pages Ruiz, who is a home builder, developer, and author who has developed affordable housing in California. California, the Midwest, and the Mountain States. His projects have numerous awards, including the Green Building Single Family House of the Year and the Workforce Housing Award from the National Association of Home Builders. He is the author of two books on affordable housing, and recently he was working with Andreas Duani on the design of neighborhoods for Latino immigrants. He's going to be, uh, uh, he's going to moderate as well as speak today, and I'm going to pass this along to Fernando. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and welcome everyone, urban pioneers and innovation rebels alike. Today, we're gonna to embark on a journey into the heart of guerrilla urbanism, where pavements turn into canvases and alleys into galleries, igniting sparks of civil creativity and sometimes disobedience that challenges and changes the status quo. By definition, guerrilla urbanism is a grassroots movement that empowers ordinary citizens to reclaim and reshape urban spaces. It involves unconventional tactics like pop-up parks, uh, street art, and guerrilla gardens. But beyond piecemeal happenings, beyond tactical urbanism, it's a bottoms-up initiative that, when it harnesses tactical events in a broad strategy towards systemic change, challenges the power structure of traditional urban planning and forces neighborhood transformation. A strategic application of tactical urbanism can transcend just temporary interventions, and we have already witnessed the power of a people's peaceful uprising in successful movements like the Yimbis, the Yes in My Backyard, which have won legislative battles across various states and have challenged and already changed the status quo. Our first speaker, Jason Hyman, he embodies this spirit of quiet revolution. Born in Houston, but raised in Chicago, he leads as broker and principal planner of Real Inc.'s office of Jason T. Hyman, Houston's only Black-led real estate brokerage with a planning department. Jason's vision bridges the Black and Brown generational wealth gap through real estate investment, exemplified by initiatives he spearheads like the Third Ward Real Estate Council. Armed with a degree in urban planning and expertise in infill development, Jason champions reinvestment in marginalized neighborhoods by nurturing a radical band of minority developers. So prepare for a journey where imagination knows no limits and the street whispers <laughs> tales of resilience and revolution. Jason, the microphone is yours. I'm going to share my screen with everyone. My hope is to give you a little bit of backdrop. So there's just a little bit of story here, but more importantly, to touch on two specific projects here in Houston that embody this guerrilla urbanism approach. And so uh, to give you a little bit of backdrop, a few years back, uh, we had neighbors here in Third Ward, which is a vastly gentrifying area, has been for some time. And everyone had this notion of wanting to be involved in managing what's going on in the neighborhood, but did not really understand how we could, especially if you aren't a developer with you know able to get loans and able to actually raise the money that you need to actually develop here in, in Houston. And so we set out on a mission to try to figure out, you know, how do we create space in our neighborhood for everyone to kind of participate in the development process. And so we 
end up starting a nonprofit organization. It didn't start out that way. Kind of came about out of necessity. So when we talk about guerrilla urbanism, uh, one of the things that we saw was in terms of resources and awareness, a lot of the same organizations in the city and the neighborhood got the attention. And sometimes issues didn't get necessarily resolved on the ground. And so we found that we needed to kind of step up and fill those gaps in the neighborhood. And we chose to focus here in the real estate development space by supporting local developers. We feel like they are the solution to the affordable housing, to having more options in our neighborhood because they have a vested interest there, right? And so our vision um, as a group is essentially to create more options in the market. We want to disrupt things, right? Here in Houston, we're notorious for subdividing lots and building three and four story homes, which are great homes for some people. But we find that in the market, folks want different options. We all live very differently. We all have different uh, things that are going on. So to have a more equitable community, we chose to focus here. And so we rally pretty much everybody around us through the logo that you see here on the screen. It's DT3M. It stands for Do the Things That Matter. TQ, the things that, if you remember from science class, this periodic table, if you can take it back, this is our formula for success. We feel like if you just kind of focus in and do the things that matter, we can be successful. And so the things that matter to us is kind of this peer-to-peer -peer support network. We educate one another, so we all take turns teaching one another. We help each other gain access to capital, whether that be through fundraising or just technical assistance and being able to you know, structure things. We share responsible development practices. So when one of us finds a hack or one of us finds something, we're quick to share it and really document it with everyone else so we all, all can benefit from that in the space. We're kind of comprised of a lot of different people. It's not just developers. Like I said, in terms of space, we feel like it's important to make that neighbors, the professionals, the developers, the everyone in the community have a space to actually either one, voice their opinion, to leverage their resources, or three, actually bring things to fruition. One of the approaches we take from a guerrilla urbanism perspective is really utilizing the media and social media to really get the word out. It's kind of hard to, let me say hard. You have large organizations like Congressman Urbanism and American Planning Association, which are very big and have, have a focus. And we figure, how can we get on their radar? How can we get on other people's radar and let them know what we're doing here and gain some more support? So we leverage a lot of the local news stations. We always are sending different media requests to them about what we're doing. And sometimes it's picked up and we gain more support in that. And so we've had conferences, our virtual library, just different tools and resources that we've used. And when I say we use, this is all kind of like bootstrap, guys. We don't have a big budget. We're using software online that's free or relatively cheap to share a lot of the information and practices that we're uh, running into. Same thing when it comes to our conferences and our workshops and meetups. We meet out on the street, right? We'll meet at a site. We're always looking for different partners and things like that in the neighborhood that align with us, that allow us to use our space so we can have those conversations um, and share that information. So I won't spend too much time here in our goals, but I do want to talk a little bit about our focus. So I talked about disrupting the market, so to speak. And so for us, that's providing those gaps in the market. So earlier I mentioned most time in Houston, in the third ward area, you're going to see three-story townhouses, like I said, which is fine, but they don't necessarily belong everywhere. And so we partner with different property owners, different professionals to come up with different design schemes that work in our neighborhood. And they're, most time we're engaging the community in that so they can give us feedback. So we don't have a vanity mindset. We tend to find sites or opportunities and ask ourselves what wants to be here, right? And then we, we figure out how to make it happen uh, together. So these are pretty much our kind of suite of things we focus on. If you see here, this is pretty much missing middle spectrum of housing. Here in Houston, thanks to the leadership of Margaret here on the call, which we'll probably touch on a little later, we now have some support here in Houston to build a little bit differently. But prior to November, we did not have that. So we had to be very creative um, in how we approach things. And so now that we have a little bit more flexibility, we're able to do 
you know, more options in the, in the market. And so I want to tell you guys, spend the bulk of the time here talking about two different projects. Both of them are commercial in nature and on our major corridor here called Emancipation Avenue in Third Ward. This is a very important corridor because it once was this very bustling historic corridor, and now it's uh, filled with different pockets of vacant lots and blighted buildings. And so we in our community want we want to be able to walk to things. But we notice or we understand it in development as the residential space is being built out, the commercial tends to come along last once there's more rooftops. Well, we wanted to get ahead of that, right? We wanted to gain control of the sites along our corridor because we felt like representation matters. Who owns the property on the commercial corridor? Mm -hmm. Who works in them? The type of businesses that are there are very representative of the neighborhood. So we want to get head of that. So we began collectively buying property together along the corridor to a point now where we're having these meetings to actually master plan this corridor. My one lot, for instance, is nothing without my neighbor's lot or his business across the street. And so now that's coming along. But I want to talk to you guys a little bit about like how this came about and some of the hurdles we've had to mm -hmm. tackle. So the particular site at the top is a 5,000 square foot site. We would like to have a two-story kind of a mixed-use building there. But due to market conditions, it's tough to build, right? This is a small-scale building. If you're familiar with building small-scale, the financing is pretty tough. There's the economies of scale are not really there. And so we end up taking more of an incremental approach. And so if you see the bottom picture, there's a couple of containers, garden, vendor, a slab to host vendors. And so this is pretty much designed as a pop-up market. It's an outdoor pop-up market. And we chose to go this route because next door there's a comic book store and next door to that is a actual bookstore. And both of them said they want places that they can go and hang out and their customers want that as well. So it, it just worked really well. Uh, but it wasn't from us. It was from the engagement from folks around us about what to do with this space. Now, in terms of getting this space together, there's no utilities or anything like that there. And because there's a blighted building, there's a little resistance from the city to allow us to have utilities and things like that there. So we're finding some different hacks and shortcuts around that. For instance, uh, we're exploring solar to get this done. If not solar, we're exploring even subdividing the lot. And just leaving the front half as the building and the back half is just vacant grass where there's no issue with getting utilities there. And so those are some things we're having to work around. The space itself, the vacant building, instead of leaving it blighted, we've talked to artists in the community as well as the universities there near us to come and do like a rotating exhibit on all four walls. That'll go on for about the next at least three years and we'll use collectively any revenue generated from that to kind of go back into the future project to help balance out some of those economies of scale. We also are talking with the city, for instance, around how do we begin to use, or our management district here, how do we begin to use our TERS or our TIF funding to fill the gap from a capital stack perspective in these smaller scale developments, especially since we want Houston to be more walkable. Right. So we want to have these smaller buildings there. So these are some of those issues that we're coming across, the financing, our utilities and just the use. What do you do with these spaces that you can't necessarily build or develop on just yet? So this is one example. The second example down at the bottom, very similar. But in this case, we have more space because it's about 12,000 square feet. We're not big on parking lots, but our area doesn't have a lot of parking. And so while our area goes through this transformation and we know that our main corridor will be kind of redeveloped, that space is being cleared for parking, but with a twist, right? We don't want to have it parking just in the evenings when there's a lot of activities and like the bars and things like that. But during the day, this will be just a mixed use space where trucks and vendors can come and have a space where people can patronize them. And so there's a little bit of mix there. No hurdles necessarily with that one, but we still had to approach this in talking to the low, our neighbors around us to figure out what exactly needs to be. And then in both cases, it's trying to figure out how do we make this make sense for us financially, 
right? Getting utilities or replats or doing anything to this place is either one triggers the city for a certain requirement or two, you know, it costs to invest in the space. So what we've been doing is really keying in on small community grants all around the city in different organizations. So whether it's you know, two five hundred dollars, five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, we apply to all of these different funding sources throughout the year so that we can take care of the art murals, we can take care of the garden, we can take care of the vendor booths. But in that we, we're making sure that when you talk about gorilla, how we write that is very important. We're really big in our neighborhood and our organization on the notion of equity. And so when we talk about gardens, for instance, it's not just a garden, it's a training center, right? When we talk about our vendor pop-up, this is economic stability and capacity building for the area. And when we talk about some of the other spaces like trucks, we're in a food desert. And so we're trying to solve problems for the neighborhood while gaining control of the property and planning for the future. I'll stop there, Fernando. Just in case there's, any, I see there's questions in the chat, but I can't see them just yet. But I think we're going to do the questions at the end, following our discussion. Okay. And I know I have a lot of questions actually, as you were as you were speaking. Some it's fantastic projects and a, and a beautiful, truly incredible approach. So let's move on to Margaret's section, and then we'll get back with all the questions for each one of you in a little discussion that we can have to kind of get things going. So right now, we're going to get ready to dive beyond the surface of polite urbanism as we introduce Margaret Brown, a powerhouse in the field of urban planning and policy. Those of us here in Houston know this very well. With nearly four decades of experience shaping cities, Margaret's tenure as director of the Houston Planning and Development Department was marked by a laser focus on walkability, affordability, and equity, things we have seen come to pass now as our city of Houston has kind of become a little bit chic. It's uh, it's the talk of the nation now. Many people want to imitate what brought Houston to these kind of revolutionary approaches to, to urban planning, and here we have the person that led that revolution. Margaret's innovative approach, including establishing walkable places and transit-oriented development ordinances and revolutionizing parking regulations and sidewalk standards. These were to enhance pedestrian connectivity and safety. In just two years, Margaret's advocacy for Vision Zero under the good mayor Sylvester Turner significantly reduced pedestrian fatalities and injuries within Houston. In her most recent achievement, Margaret secured City Council approval for comprehensive revisions to Houston's residential development rules. And this is what Jason referred to when he said we, as of November, had some opportunities that we didn't used to have. She championed a radically diverse housing landscape that meets the needs of all Houstonians and inspires other cities to dare and make change. So get ready to be inspired by Margaret Brown, who will take us beyond the surface and into the heart of sometimes impolite but transformative guerrilla urbanism. Margaret? That is certainly an introduction. I will have to say, though, that while Vision Zero has been successful, we have not made the progress we wanted to make. We've still got a long way to go protecting pedestrians and bicyclists and, and even drivers in Houston. Vision Zero, which is our effort to eliminate deaths and serious injuries by automobile crashes by the year 2030 has seen progress over the past two years. We have reduced the number of crashes and deaths, but um, we have a long way to go. So that being said, we we're hopeful that uh, we'll see a lot of progress in the future years. I want to talk not so much about land development, which is where I spent much of my career, but about some of the things that happen when neighbors get together and just decide to do something. Jason's work in Third Ward is really making a difference. It's both a collaborative and a direct boots on the ground type of activity. And so that is really what motivates Houston and Houstonians. As a little bit of an intro, you know, Houston has withstood multiple natural disasters over the past 10 years, floods and hurricanes, and, and we have seen a lot of damage happen to our city. And what we noticed, particularly after Hurricane Harvey, was that people were relatively, they had meeting fatigue. We had been planning, we had done a resilient plan, we had worked on resilient plans for neighborhoods and plans after Ike and so forth. And what people wanted was progress not planning. We're a city that plans, but we recognized that people started wanting, wanting to start to see things instantly. 
So one of the ways the, the city pivoted was we started doing more tactical urbanism. And I'm going to talk about the difference. Fernando gave us the definition, but let me just start by saying, you know, tactical urbanism is the polite way to, int- to initiate change. It usually includes gallons of brightly colored temperate paint, Saturday morning coffee and donuts. The city often coordinates it, creates the idea for it, and then expands it to the neighborhoods. These are photographs and I'm going to just go through them slightly quickly because I think they're just really indicative of a terrific project we did with the Franklin Elementary School that was on a busy street, how we helped them identify ways they could slow traffic without rebuilding the streets. And we they painted things in the street in front of the school. You know, it was a great collaborative, but that's more tactical. That's not the guerrilla urbanism that we've been talking about. And as we talk about tactical, most everybody knows about the 2007, 2009 changes to Times Square, where somebody purchased 376 folding chairs and just put them in the middle of the street. Now, again, the city supported that. It was a test case for how can we transport Times Square into something that's more visitor friendly, more humanist. You know, it was a great success. But again, that was supported. It wasn't do first and ask for permission later. And so those are all great projects, things that many of your communities are doing. But there's also a lot of work going on in America where people are actually making the change that is necessary or that they believe is necessary and then asking for forgiveness. A great organization that I want to highlight that's going, that is currently operating in Los Angeles is a nonprofit called Crosswalk Collective LA. And they basically go and paint crosswalks in LA where they believe that the city of LA has not done the work necessary to protect pedestrians. Here's their website. And you can, as a resident or as a person who lives in LA, identify a crosswalk you want. They have a how-to guide. It's very simple. So you can select a crosswalk that you think needs to be better protective for the pedestrians, and then they'll go in and they'll paint it. Here's some examples. I believe this one. So this is a crosswalk where in 2023, they painted it. Two women had been killed there crossing the street back in 1998. And the city's response was to simply put up this stop sign and not to do anything else. And so after many years of asking for permission to get us get crosswalks painted, this group went in and just did it themselves. And they believe that this has been the turning point for providing better safety. Um, here's another one. They use a lot of yellow paint, but these are all. This is a crosswalk across the street from a school that had not been painted by the city, and they just believed needed to happen. And then these are four crosswalks installed in East Hollywood. Again, busy school, busy neighborhood, lots of traffic, but a needing a way for pedestrians to feel safer. So here's one thing you can do. Get some yellow and white paint and go out and paint the crosswalk that you believe your city needs or your neighborhood needs. They do have on their website, the city comes back and unpaints these crosswalks sometimes because they don't meet AASHTO standards or some other reason. So sometimes the work of guerrilla urbanists is removed. I think you just need to stay active and you just need to stay on point and do it again. And maybe by doing and redoing, we'll get the cities to start recognizing There are other ways I found, as I did some research, I found some really interesting ways that cities or residents are protecting their residents. Here's one in, I believe this is Wichita, Kansas. They had a painted bike lane that the bicyclists didn't feel was safe. It was on a relatively busy street. And so somebody one night went out and super glued toilet plungers to the street. It actually <laughs> it actually provided a sense of safety for the bicyclist. It was another way of notifying the drivers that something was going on in this lane. And believe it or not, the city then came back and did actually install permanent protection for the bike lane in this area. So sometimes the work of guerrilla urbanists is successful in the city follows case. Another way that guerrilla urbanists are transforming neighborhoods, particularly vacant lots, neighborhoods that may be seeing some disinvestment going on, is to just take over the space and create nothing but a garden. This is a garden in Fifth Ward on a vacant lot, Fifth Ward in Houston, Texas. This is a vacant lot that's just been an eyesore for the community for years. And so the community came together and just planted things. It feeds the neighborhood. This is also another food desert. So it provides fresh vegetables to the neighborhood. It's 
easily removable if the property owner requires it or if something else happens to the property. It's not a huge investment by the community. It's a large investment of time, but there's a great benefit for it. So this type of work and urbanism is really successful and goes on in a number of cities across America and you know can be really supportive for the neighborhood itself. So here's back to Houston, back to my hometown. And there's a street called Montrose Boulevard, which is in the Montrose neighborhood that is wide and has, as you see behind these people, lots of oak trees down the median, but it also has very inferior drainage and inferior pedestrian and bicycle connections. And so the tax increment reinvestment zone is rebuilding the street to improve the drainage. It's essentially a drainage project, but what they decided to do was go ahead and take the opportunity to increase the pedestrian access, put in 10 foot wide sidewalks and really make the street more walkable and more connected to the neighborhood. Well, in the process, they're going to have to tear, they're going to have to remove, I believe the number is 200 trees. Some of them are oaks, not the ones in the median that you see behind these people, but many of them are distressed trees kind of growing up in the cracks of the sidewalks and things like that. And so they have decided that removing these trees is beneficial to the larger project. They are actually going to replace the trees removed by, I think, double the number of trees. I'm not sure. I don't know all the specifics about it. But the bottom line is the neighborhoods did not appreciate it. And so they actually yarn bombed the trees along the street. So these trees would be taken out in this project and the neighborhood thought this was a way to show how much they cared and to protect the trees and to identify those as, as trees that they didn't want removed. I don't know how this is ultimately going to play out. It's a project that the city and that the neighborhood ultimately needs, but will we be able to protect, to complete this project and protect the trees or rebuild and replant more trees? I don't know. So those are just some examples. I'd like to hear from the audience what some of their creative ideas are. I'm going to stop here. Fernando, I'm sure you've got a lot of questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes, fantastic. Thank you very much. And beautiful slides, too. Those those images are <laughs> spectacular. And, and it's great because you've shown some really practical stuff that people are doing and that likely will cause some sort of change or at least some sort of compromise in the direction that things would have gone had they not intervened. So I'm very impressed. And I do have some questions about that. But let's go back to Jason for a minute. And Jason, one thing that kind of stood out in your presentation is the fact that the way development is done traditionally is a developer comes in from out of town has purchased land, they own it, and they decide they want to do something, you know, their vision, whatever it is, fantastic vision, lousy vision, they want to create that in that land. And then, the new, you know, often the neighborhood feels like, hey, this is not exactly what we wanted here mm -hmm. next door. And so your approach is so different. And I'm wondering, you did speak about having to go to the neighbors to key them into what you were wanting to do and get their input on it. I imagine that your reception is completely different than the standard developer's reception of resistance from the neighborhood, given that the developers are the neighborhood. <laughs> so. Correct. But you know, Fernando, there's still, there's still opposition, so to speak. You still have neighbors that in a community like this are, are nervous or scared about change. And so if you don't understand development, if you don't understand what's needed, it can be scary. And so sometimes there's pushback there. But what we do is we invite everybody out. We just make it open. So if we're doing design, we're doing something like that. It's an event, right? We have food, things like that. And people come out and they draw, they put stuff, you know, we do an engagement mm -hmm. event. And it's not something that, like you say, most developers do. And we also bring in, if there are developers that exist in the area, we try to connect neighbors with them. So there's an ecosystem there. Well, I think that's a great approach. Now, prior to the changes that Margaret secured through, you know, the, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, livable neighborhoods, how did you go about making very different types of development? Because the type of development you had, like in the third world, ward responded to what the zoning, and well, there was no zoning, but what development codes allowed and incentivized. How did you change that before? I, I ask this only because, well, you now have the benefit of this change that Margaret brought in. That's a big change in the lot standards and what you can do on a lot in Houston. But before that, how was the struggle? I wonder, because most people are not living in a city with the benefit of having had Margaret for four years as their planning director. <laughs> So for the past couple of years, there's been a big focus, you know, just around density. And so really one of the only things that we could do is sort of like come up with very creative and different applications of like 
duplexes. Mm -hmm. And that's what you begin seeing a lot of. That's where we played for some time, but now being able to do some different site configurations, we're able to get, you know, triplexes, accessory dwelling units, just even the way we subdivide the lot where there used to be just, you know, three simple cut subdivide. We're able to do some very unique lot configurations to uh, get the proper design on the site. So before you had to settle for what was doable and now you can just be creative and, and do something much more similar to what you'd like ultimately. And I mean, even in those duplexes, we still had to kind of thread, you know, different code and things like that where we want to get creative, but that was the limitation, yes. Margaret, I, I liked your examples and it brought to mind as a gal in Chicago. I don't remember her name. She's an architect, but she's done something similar in that in Chicago, and, and maybe you know this, Jason, having lived there, there are many neighborhoods where there's just a lot of old homes that have been abandoned and are being torn down. Some of them quite beautiful, you know, some of them really neighborhood gems, but abandoned and the city will come in and tear them down. So one mm -hmm. thing that she has done is she has gone and painted the exterior of these homes before they get torn down. I guess there's a some kind of signage that they put on the on the houses before they get torn down. So she can identify which ones will be demolished. She goes out and completely repaints the place, makes it look absolutely gorgeous and stunning. And then people suddenly appreciate something they're about to lose, <laughs> you know, and, and she's hoping somehow to generate change in time just because the very residents walking around or driving see, wow, that's I never noticed how beautiful that place could be. It's interesting to see that kind of impetus. But I wonder, Margaret, in your role when you were head of the planning department, how would you respond to those kinds of initiatives? Like people going, or I'm wondering what would happen to me if I went out and painted a big slow down sign in the middle of the road in front of my house, which I, now I'm really tempted to do that. Will I get arrested? What happens? What are the risks of being a guerrilla urbanist? Well, I think it depends on exactly what you're doing. If you paint a big slow down, possibly what would happen is when we get around to it in six months, a year, we'd repaint it. And we're not going to figure out who you are, I doubt. You know, there is the challenge, and they talk about that in the LA Collaborative, the crosswalk group, that they have painted crosswalks two or three times because the city comes back behind them and mm -hmm. and repaints them or unpaints them, I guess. There's been a number of questions in the chat about getting fined or being arrested for being on private property. There is certainly a difference between the, the gardening on private property versus the painting on public property. I think there's, while the city will come back and probably undo it, there's probably less possibility for arrest when you're doing it on the street. And depending on, you know, doing it at the right time of day, people may not even, you know, the city may not even catch it. So there is always a risk. But there have been a number of times where we have seen people take things into their own hand and then we've considered, you know, making it a permanent. So it, it all depends on, you know, does it meet our standards? Does it meet the AASHTO, the, the, regu the transportation standards? nationwide. How can we get to yes on this is some of the questions we often ask. Because we support, you know, the city is a is interested absolutely in pedestrian safety. Being a Vision Zero city, we have a great deal of interest in figuring out how to get all people to be able to move around our city safely. And if one of the these tactics seems to be working, then then let's figure out how to make it permanent. There, a lot of the questions have to do exactly with what you just answered. <laughs> There's a lot of concern, you know, what are the risks of this type of approach? And there is a question, in fact, we had a dialogue on this via email before uh, this webinar took place about the use of the term guerrilla or little war in terms of this, and that that term has, you know, some fairly negative connotations in certain contexts because it really does speak of war you know, of actual guerrilla fighting, which is, you know, the small war fighting that often takes place in places like Colombia in particular. And the gal that was really kind of challenging the use of that word in this context was uh, from Colombia and her experiences. Uh, I also know, though, it has been a term that has been adopted in the United States, like words often are in different languages, with a very positive meaning in the sense of rebellion, but not necessarily armed rebellion. And it actually has some positive connotations within the Latin culture, too, if you think of the guerrilla fighters as, you know, the troops of Simon Bolivar that liberated 
the guerrilla fighters that liberated Cuba from uh, the Spaniards. And our own Andres Duany's grandfather was such a guerrilla fighter liberating Cuba from the Spaniards. So it is a term that depends a little bit on who those guerrilleros are and what their cause is. And, and in modern times, yes, it has had negative connotations. And I appreciate that. I just wanted to acknowledge that for those of you that might be attending that understand the term and its actual Spanish language use. So there's a lot of good compliments like awesome that you're proactive. And this is for Jason. And I love your statement about neighborhoods rely on neighbors. Looking to some actual questions here. Small community grants. Are there any small community grants that are provided from a civic perspective, cities? The city of Houston. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Jason. You, you probably know more about it than I do. Go right ahead. Man, they're, they're all over. Right now, for example, our management district really is supportive of the revitalization of this corridor. So they're issuing grants to demo or beautify. The city of Houston has a matching grant program. AARP has grant program. And so... Where are some other ones? Here, LISC has some small community grants as well. And so outside of that, we fundraise by, you know, for instance, this past Saturday, we did a workshop on market research and feasibility. And we have folks just kind of pay what they want registration. And so we raise a few bucks from them doing things like that as well. Have you had any uh, fundraising where the neighborhood kicked in for a project and actually raised uh, enough funds to either purchase land or, or is this all individuals investing? You know, the organization, we have our groups there and then uh, we have our organization. Um, and then there's a core group of us that are a little bit more in tune with development and finance and things like that. So we start, kind of serve as a nucleus for others. When you talk about projects, for instance, we have a pilot out on the north side of town right now with emerging developer where the, the core group of us will be raising funds for him on his behalf, for instance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's something that he didn't have access to. He didn't, he doesn't know a fund manager. He doesn't, you know, he's just trying to get his first deal under his belt so that mm -hmm. he can build more in his neighborhood. Oh, oh good. Now, someone, um, Rick, Avemsky wrote in that the artist in Chicago that I was mentioning is Amanda Williams, who paints abandoned houses. And, and it's really worth looking into. If you want to look that up, I'm sure you can Google her name and see some images of what she's done. And then Kyle Bartell says he's the co-founder of Sit On It Detroit, where they build benches for bus stops, parks, and social gathering spaces, and expanding to other outdoor amenities for neighborhoods. And I guess beyond just having a comfortable place to sit at the bus stop, you're also kind of creating third places in, in some instances. So that's good work. I'm glad to hear of these other examples because they can inspire people to do something very, very, very similar. Let's see. A lot of compliments here on the Q&A. Anonymous attendee, what are the strategies you've used to get past the long-standing community leaders who do not want things to change? I don't want new people in the neighborhood or can bog down the process. I guess that would be one uh, one for you, Jason. So I, I think two things. One, before we really got moving in what we're doing, I was the community leader, right? So I stepped up to be president and kind of make the connections and the relationships to show that I'm here for their interests. That's one. The second thing to that is we made sure we weren't in somebody else's lane. That was the most important thing. So you have a lot of neighborhood organizations or community leaders here. No one in our neighborhood was focusing on what we're focusing on right now. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. There's still community leaders, of course, that, as the question says, doesn't want things to change. But those two approaches made a very big difference. Very good. And this question is for Margaret, another maybe the same anonymous attendee, says he or she is from Los Angeles and is wondering if Houston has a similar conversation around parking vehicles and public transit when discussing housing or commercial development. In other words, how do you get away from or get past the insistence that cars are the dominant form of transportation? And I know you've you've dealt with this a lot in Houston. It is a big challenge, um, particularly in Sunbelt cities that are so spread out as Houston, Los Angeles, some of the other cities. We 
proposed with the livable places changes, we were very successful in getting the different styles of housing types approved by city council. But one of the other proposals we made was to eliminate minimum parking requirements for all residential development near transit, near high frequency bus routes, high comfort bike lanes. There were four areas that we were recommending that minimum parking requirements be eliminated and the neighborhoods didn't support that and I couldn't get it through city council. So we still have the complicating, you know, it's a contradiction in terms. People want walkability, but they also want the ability to park their car when they go. And and for the most part, you can have kind of a balance of both of those. But when you become so auto dominant, it really, even if you're building walkable streets, it really makes walkability less possible because you've got parking lots, you're walking. You know, Jeff Speck is great at, at identifying the five things that you need for a good walk. And I can't remember exactly what all five of them are, but density and interesting walk is always critical. And if you're always walking past parking lots, that makes it not so interesting. So mm-hmm. parking is something we are going to, ad- the city is probably going to address in the future. It was nothing that I could actually get accomplished while mm-hmm. I was there. And Jason mentioned earlier that a lot of third ward was built before we had parking requirements in place at all. And so how do you keep the historic aspect of the development pattern in a neighborhood where now you've got a requirement for additional parking? It's mm-hmm. it's a challenge. I guess the answer is you just keep working at it and hope you get somebody yeah. like Margaret Brown to champion your cause you at keep playing along at it. It's interesting. Parking and building codes. I will tell you, you mentioned Yimby Town earlier. It was a terrific conference. And the beauty of the Yimby Town movement is that it draws in people from really across the whole spectrum. It draws in conservatives who want to reduce or eliminate regulations mm-hmm. and housing advocates, both, you know, not necessarily people that are always in the same room together. And so the, the Yimby Town movement is about removing and and right-sizing parking requirements as well, particularly as it relates to residential development. And so there's some, there is some potential in that group as it grows to be more effective in that way. Yeah. And the success of that group has always been its ability to harness the causes of both right and left sides of the political spectrum, one through property private property rights and the other through social equity. And they've been able to, rather than fight, (laughs) have been able to collaborate towards the same end. Now, there is a question, which I think is a good one. What factors go into deciding whether to go the tactical Mm. route of seeking involvement or support from the city versus the guerrilla route of asking for forgiveness later, or or I guess paying the fine? (laughs) The the cost and the complexity are are, are what's going to uh, get it going. The cost and the complexity. If I go to the city and there's a lot of pushback and the cost is minimal to show, I'm just going to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. If I know it's complex. So earlier we talked about the lot where we're getting some resistance to having electrical there because there's a mm-hmm. vacant building. They don't want to, we're going to get the electricity and put a T-pole there. <laughs> we're going to get electricity. Mm-hmm. And it will, T-pole, you mean a temporary power pole? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we're going to activate the space, right, in a safe mm-hmm. way. But in that case, to your point, I mean, the most they're going to probably do is, is say what, you know, take it down. So we're okay with that. We're okay with that. Fine. We're okay with taking it down because it proves what we're doing, right? It, it We get support from the community about what needs to go there and why mm-hmm. that needs to change, right? And you could always replace the power pole with a generator if need be. With a generator, correct. Now, there's a uh, kind of a... A little bit of a, this is a a little bit of a sad question here from uh, Len Bea. I hope I pronounce your your last name right, Len. He says he lives in a coastal community where gentrification is virtually complete. We have extremely high property values and no blighted areas. Meanwhile, the city and county governments are aggressively pursuing new large-scale development, mostly by out-of-town developers. As a result, citizen initiatives get quashed very quickly. Other than black parties, do-it-yourself urban changes are flat out illegal. Would you have any tips on how to implement incremental changes in a neighborhood scale under these difficult circumstances? I guess either of you could jump in. I'm going to start out by saying most communities DIY urban changes are illegal. 
So what we're talking about is finding a way around the rules or bending them a little bit, Mm -hmm. as Jason's doing. So let me just say, first of all, we hear your pain, but you're not alone, that that most of what we're talking about today has is not condoned by the by the government. Jason, do you want to add to that or, or complement that? So I would say in this case where you feel like gentrification is virtually complete and the market is what it is in your neighborhood, this is where, at least for us, even at, from a civic level, that I was very big on like being proactive in making mm-hmm. friends with the developers. Go find your developer and champion them. So one of the things that we did as a civic organization was we champion for the developers that championed us. So meaning those variances that they needed, so on and so forth, they need your support just as much as you want to have them in your neighborhood. So it may take coffee. It may take, you know, attending the local, you know, Urban Land Institute kind of thing and finding an ally. From what you're saying, it doesn't seem like there's anything incremental to, to focus on. There's nothing incremental to focus on, but some of this new development by out-of-town developers may be able to be steered or or nudged in a better direction in terms of enhancing whatever qualities that you want in, in the neighborhood by joining with that developer and promising support in, cert- in exchange for certain, mm-hmm. you could say, concessions in their plan. And that's what the Yimbies did. They said, you want to do that? We'll come out. We'll support you. We'll have a whole bunch of hippies there cheering your project on <laughs> if... It includes some affordable housing or if it has walkable areas or, you know, whatever it is that you're champion. And, and that that's a very positive way of doing it through an incentive rather than through opposition, you know, because I'm sure some of those even in your area where the city and county governments are aggressively pursuing new large scale development, there must be some NIMBY opposition that you can provide a counterweight to. So but that's probably the answer. Now, a question for Jason, how do you get the funding to purchase the housing? I think you've, you've kind of obliquely referred to this, but not answered it, you know, really head on. And I think people probably want to know, how do you get the funding for this kind of incremental development, particularly in areas that are, you know, where the, the market elements aren't there to easily finance it? So our organization is part of growing our community. We identify impact investors, those folks that really champion what we're doing. They have affinity for the area and they have the finances to be able to help us control those sites. And so whether it be family, friend, and our neighbors, if there's an opportunity, for example, one of the properties that you saw was sold Mm -hmm. to us for probably half of what it was worth because that owner really believed in what we were doing and want to see that can continue. In that, we were able to get, you know, a few of us. Honestly, we went and got private loan and we just kind of paid a little bit, been paying together on it in mm-hmm. order to get to the next step or the next phase. So it's very unorthodox. It's very kind of like, what do we have in our pockets? <laughs> what resource do we have? So mm-hmm. it's a little different each time, but always with the notion that uh, we're going to go in just like a traditional de- development process. We're going to go in. We're going to gain site control. We're going to flush out what this project is and take the risk out. And then for us, we go back to our impact investors and our neighbors to see if they want to be a part of the actual development so that they are empowered and have some ownership. And if not ownership, at least they've been a part of the process itself. Since you have a nonprofit and maybe are doing some of these guerrilla type interventions uh, through the, the entity, if you will, rather mm-hmm. than on the sly on your own. There is a question that I think is interesting, and and it's how do you deal with the liability issues, particularly in the public right-of-way? There is some liability in maybe putting up these toilet on stoppers. A car runs into a a bicyclist and blames whoever did that. So how do you deal with the liability? Do you have an insurance that allows you to do guerrilla urbanism? Do you have a guerrilla urbanism clause in your policy? No, not quite, not quite. I don't want to say that we don't deal with the public right-of-way as much. There are organizations in the area that we support in that. Most of our work is done around vacant, blighted spaces. And so whether it's us controlling that site or we just work with that neighbor, that owner, and they give us permission. They write a letter, they give us permission. And yes, we will, through the organization, put insurance on that particular piece of property. I guess this is uh, one of our last questions is from an anonymous attendee, but it's for you, Jason. And that's that they notice that it's easy to get funds sometimes for development, for construction. People love, you know, donating to the new building or the new recreation center or whatever. But what about maintaining the property? How do you, how do you get your funds for ongoing maintenance? We just really try to think sustainably. 
right? So the first site that I showed you guys, yeah, we, we had been having to pick trash up and get the grass. But again, we would have workshops or different events that would cover the 100, 200 bucks to cover, you know, cut grass and things like that. But in terms of ongoing, the site itself, we're just taking all the grass out. So the grass mm-hmm. will be either turf or, you know, native to just reduce maintenance. And then it's being fenced in to keep a lot of the traffic and trash and things like that. So we are controlling the circulation of the space. People can come in kind of one one place. Trucks or vendors can come in one place to mm-hmm. try to manage the trash and all that kind of stuff. So we're out of time. Robert's back. Yes, uh, we are <laughs> at the end of an hour. And uh, I don't know whether you have any final words to say. I wanted to tell folks that we, we're going to be posting the uh, video tomorrow on the CNU website. And for folks who want to share it or other people will be watching it on YouTube after the fact. If any of you you know, have any final words to say, uh, I guess we could say it now. You know, I, I think I'll just kind of end with where I started and that, you know, I think, really believe that you guys here are the solutions in your neighborhood. So be vocal, get involved, and take action. Margaret? So from my experience working for a public agency, there are many times we ask, we really do ask for input and don't get it until, you know, it's very late. And we always, people who are complaining are always the ones that that we hear from. What we'd like to hear is more collaborative, is, you know, come help us with ideas, Come, come see us and talk with us about all the different options that are available. And and so public agencies really do want to hear from the public. Be be vocal. Well, I guess my closing remarks would be, don't be afraid. Just get out there and change the world. And thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, Fernando, Margaret, Jason, and everybody who attended today. And have a great rest of the day. Thank you.